During the 6th century AD, a way of life advanced in southern Italy that changed the course of Western civilization. It's really a wonderful life, it's, uh, but it's impossible to describe, it's impossible to um, put into words what is, uh, uh, what the feeling or the expression of the life brings out. It's something that has to be lived. I would say it's a good life with a lot of struggles. <laughs> well, and I find that the, the life here very fulfilling. Uh, I have more time to uh, uh, intimate with God. While the Roman Empire crumbled and chaos reigned, this way of life put organization and structure to a new religious movement, one that eventually dominated all of Europe and Russia and today has spread throughout the world. The Benedictines derived their name from a great saint by the name of Benedict of Nursia who was born in Italy. He sent missionaries all over the world. In fact, he's known as the patron of Europe. He evangelized the whole of Europe, made a Christian. For Christianity, and we have to say, of course, uh, Western Christianity, monasticism's role as uh, an evangelization project, its role as a school of spirituality, its role as preserver of ancient literature uh, is irreplaceable. This way of life encouraged education. Uh, the only schools we had for many centuries were monastic schools and cathedral schools. You could say that the, the educational system that we have today can be traced back to early monasticism. A lot of the you know, the things that make us who we are were, were, uh, were born in this enterprise. Even things like universities, which are, which are a very powerful force in, in our society today. You can, you can see, the, you can see the, the, you know, them in seminal form in, in, the, in the monastery schools. This way of life generated, guided, and protected culture. When St. Benedict started up his own monastery and wrote a rule for the monasteries that would follow his way of life. The monasteries were meant to be places of seclusion. Very quickly after his time, the church began to use monasteries as mission stations as Christianity began to spread into Central and Northern Europe from the South. So by that very fact, the monasteries became centers of evangelization. Since monks were educated, they also became centers of learning. And since they were places of concentrated, pooled material resources, they also became economic centers, cultural centers uh, throughout Europe. And this way of life nurtured art, architecture, and music. The uh, uh, artisans not only acquired much of their proficiency from the training in the monasteries, but the major building for centuries and centuries would have been churches and monasteries. Some of the art, not all of it obviously, some of the architecture, 
the library, the copying, the literature, the agriculture, the spirituality, and above all, the music. Probably not above all, but you know, music was never written down before monks wrote it down. This way of life, which contributed so much to Western culture, we call monasticism. Monk comes from the, um, the Greek word monos, which means one, solitary. A monk is a person who is solitary, and it could be, as, as the early desert fathers were, and they, they were first monks, they would go off and live by themselves in the desert. They would go off and live in a cave or in a tomb or whatever. But uh, then, basically, when they start coming together, and this was uh, a, uh, a thought of St. Anthony of the desert, where we were, live in a uh, monastery, a chenobium it was really called, and we're cenobites, so we would then uh, look for a one purpose. Basically, we're all here for one purpose, so the monk is one who joins a family, and we're all working for one goal. Every monastery, and a Benedictine monastery certainly, is uh, a family. We elect our own father in a very democratic way, but uh, we elect them for life and we live together as brothers. Living in community is, according to St. Benedict, is what makes the, the, uh, the best monk. Before there was a, uh, the, the fervor to go off and be by yourself and be a hermit, to live in the tombs, as they call them, and uh, Benedict would say, no, there's a, a better way of doing this where we can support one another the idea of the cenobitic life. And, and I think he contributed largely to people seeing that, living together at peace with one another, in essence of being founded, of course, finding that foundation in Christ. But when you live with others in special close quarters, uh, uh, as we do in community, there's uh, ample ch opportunity to serve and also to overcome your own selfishness and to, to be generous to others. And in all those things, you see Christ in your neighbor news. Without the spiritual and cultural leadership provided by monastics for hundreds of years, we might still be engulfed in the futility of the Dark Ages. We have that period of, of the classical world falling apart, and then the monasticism emerges as this, this new dynamic force that um, it, it's a whole cultural enterprise that, that it, it starts as, as, as little, little seeds and, and then it, it, you know, it builds the whole, the whole great edifice of medieval culture starts to be built around these, these little monasteries. So in, in a lot of ways we, we owe much of, of the unique characteristics of Western culture, of Western civilization to, to this thing we call uh, Chris, Christian monasticism. Anyone who has studied uh, any time at all the, the history of the Western civilization would understand that uh, a great deal is uh, credited to St. Benedict who began uh, this form of life. Uh, one reason because it's so stable. By merging elements of Eastern and Western asceticism, St. Benedict of Nursia laid the foundation whereby a stable, prayerful, communal style of monastic life could flourish. St. Benedict envisions the whole thing in a kind of a circularity. There's the gospel as our guide, as he says, and the community life, uh, like-minded men living together in community. That's what we call uh, the community life or the cenobitic life. He uh, arranged that his monks should stay in one place and uh, he encouraged reading, he encouraged art, he encouraged uh, stability, and uh, encouraged uh, working on the soil. And all these elements uh, were very prominent in the, the cultivation of, uh, of uh, Christianity in the places where uh, uh, people were very much uh, going the other direction. The outside world floundered in ignorance and turmoil at the end of the first millennium after the birth of Christ. 
The tonality of Western music was was developed in in Gregorian chant. It it, it all it all grew out of there. The the different modes brought up to you know Bach finally de defining the tonality of of Western music. But within the monastery walls, civilization progressed. And it all started out you know very simply with these monks. You know, no doubt they, they just started just, just chanting on one tone and then embellishing it a little bit. Plants were cultivated, manuscripts were written, and chants were sung. It was a, a mixture of, of the emotional content of the text with the musical idea, it was, a, it was a marriage. Christianity was seriously practiced in a daily life ritual following St. Benedict's principles set down in his famous rule. In the monastic life, we make a deliberate intention out of living this way of life. Uh, it's even specified for us by the rule of St. Benedict. Just a little recap on the rule and what it means to us this day. We know that the first word in the rule is listen. So the monk is always a listener, one who is attentive to what the Lord is telling him. Monastics all over the world still use the rule today. I put on the board here this morning some of the things that I think uh, reflect the rule and why the rule has lasted for close to 1,500 years now. Father Abbot Charles Wright at the Prince of Peace Abbey in Oceanside, California, teaches St. Benedict's rule to monks in training as they prepare for life in the abbey. One thing is the brevity, the shortness of the rule. But he's always encouraging gentleness, always moderation. And then his spiritual wisdom in uh, inviting us to contribute ourselves completely to God because giving ourselves to God really means to grow to the max, to the maximum that he has given us. The road to a final commitment to the monastic life is a long one. Church law won't allow uh, us to be committed to religious life until we are 18 at minimum, 21 in most cases. And whatever is preparatory to that is really a kind of prelude. We don't really uh, consider yourself a religious until you at least begin in the novitiate. There are several stages to get to be a chapter member, a full-fledged member of the corporation of the community. The center of concern is the good of the individual, where this individual would be happy because God would not be calling him to an unhappy life. And we don't view life as uh, the religious life as uh, some uh, more ascetical frames of mind, as, as uh, um, just penitential, uh, but uh, uh, as a place where you can find uh, satisfaction in doing God's will. The trainee, or postulate as the new monk is called, must master the many dictates that govern life in a monastery. And you know the five vows that we are taking here, the vow of poverty, chastity, obedience, conversion of morals, and stability. Obedience is that wonderful opportunity for us to follow in the steps of Christ. It's just your willingness to do someone else's will that saves you. And that's what the whole purpose of the life is here, is to bring out of you what is the best that the Lord has given us. Very quickly, the new monk discovers how his day is structured. The term that the Benedictines have chosen to use in their motto is ora et labora, Latin terms for prayer and work. The ora is the part of our our daily life, which involves praying. We are praying for other people, and we are praying for ourselves likewise. The 
labora is that we have to work by the labor of our own hands. Accordingly, the monk's daily life revolves around work and prayer. And he has So frequently today, prayer is underestimated. The power of prayer is underestimated. When we pray, we often think of wanting to achieve something for ourselves, obtain something from God, whether it be happiness or growth. But I think rather than speak of prayer in stages, something that one must work towards, I think we should think more in terms of prayer as worship. That's quite forgotten today, that prayer, uh, the services that we attend in church, are there primarily to give worship. Prayer service, or divine office as it's called, begins early every day. Once we are able to, to transcend, once we are able to communicate with the Lord, and the power that is drawing us, then we find a peace. There's a, there's a joy that comes about by knowing you're doing what you were designed to do. The key ingredient to any kind of growth in the life of prayer is personal honesty, that one increasingly sees what he really is before God and also is given to see what God really is. And that kind of honesty about oneself and the admission of what God is brings your life gradually in harmony with God's will so that your worship becomes increasingly unselfconscious and uh, it becomes more of a real relationship. Prayer service continues throughout the day combined with psalm and scripture readings, and of course, with chanting. Well, there are two kinds of prayer, roughly speaking, that we do as monks. There's the prayer that we have together, rather structured and formal. Our Father, who art in heaven, and then there's, of course, the times for our own private personal prayer, alone. And prayer lasts until night, when the monks retire in silence. People often think, that monks take a vow of silence. Well, we don't, and no one does. But we do have a discipline of silence and times for silence. What you see going on externally in a monastery, well, well, there really isn't all that much. All the real important work is going on in here, inside it, its interior work. Long periods of silence mark the life of a monastic. It's necessary to us because the rule of St. Benedict demands it. Uh, there are uh, mostly times of silence rather than times of speaking. The monks practice silence for several reasons. First thing that, that silence does is, is it reduces the amount of external stimuli, uh, stimulus, and so, that, uh, so that the monk's not reacting to things coming at him. And it's only in that climate, that milieu of silence, can he develop the freedom to be, you know, to work on this interior transformation that's the important work going on. Silence is the main factor that creates one to be centered in Christ. Without that silence, we never could get in touch with God in the first place. We often use words to mislead ourselves or to deceive others. Uh, we also use words to attack other persons. And so the deliberate practice of silence is something ascetical, whereby we set aside a human faculty that can be used to injure, that can be used to mislead ourselves and others. And 
We don't necessarily feel this silence, but we offer it to God. Silence also serves another important purpose. Our life here is one of listening, because that's the very first word in the rule, is to listen. Monks have been uh, uh, perfect examples just through the centuries of opening and being silent, being open to God so that God could speak to them. And that's why we have such profound writings in the early, early church with Augustine and so forth, because they opened up to God in silence. Most meals are eaten in silence broken only by a lector, who reads to the group. The church of their childhood, and three like myself, had converted to lifelong practice. But at evening recreation, and on weekends and feast days, there's opportunity for socializing. Each monk is given a job to do on a daily basis. That is how the order was founded, and this is how it thrives today. Their individual work contributes to the smooth operation and self-sufficiency of the community. We carry on our own individual community life, which is uh, dedicated to the praise of God, and uh, we try to maintain uh, ourselves and keep, keep ourselves out of mischief by working. Two people working together can accomplish much more than the sum of each working individually. So the synergism, when you have 24 people working together, we work and we all do our various jobs. And that's basically what had freed in the Middle Ages, freed many people to do their own jobs, uh, whether it be art, architecture, uh, uh, calligraphy, or uh, agriculture, beekeeping, uh, med medicine, uh, bookkeeping, whatever the case might have been, it freed them. They didn't have to all work for the same thing to make a living, and they were free to do their various trades and express themselves. I was a journeyman carpenter before joining the community, so when I got here, they made a plumber out of me. I'm the secretary to Father Abbott, both Abbots, and I'm the vestiarius, uh, also assistant to MC, Master of Ceremony for uh, Pontifical uh, Occasions. I'm in charge of the novitiate building and a designated driver. <laughs> I remember right before I entered the monastery, I said, ah, no more accounting, no more, uh, no more paperwork, no more records, you know. And as soon as I made my solemn vows, no, I mean my simple vows, but I would cloud, uh, told me that I'm going to be working in the business office. And then after my solemn vows, he appointed me as a treasurer. So here I am, <laughs> doing the books. God has a very good sense of humor. <laughs> Brother Blaze serves a traditional Benedictine role as a beekeeper. This would form a foundation where the bees would build on, build on to, and they'll put in they put their, they'll store their honey into this foundation. After that, it goes into the hive, and then the, uh, the bees will fill that with honey. And this electric knife, it's a hot knife, it will remove the, uh, the wax coating that is on the sealing the honey inside. After the capping is removed from both sides, then, then it goes into this machine here. This machine is, a, is an extractor, and, and the honey uh, will, be, will come out of the comb with centrifugal force. There's a lot of honey, you know, here in the cappings. I can extract about um, 25 gallons. In, in one day. Of all the jobs performed, the essential role of Father Abbott keeps a monastery functioning efficiently. The job is an awesome task because it not only means that uh, you have to lead a corporation, you have to be an administrator of a corporation, but you have to lead souls also. So uh, if I were a uh, chief executive officer of a corporation out there somewhere, 
I would be responsible for the work that they produce for eight hours. But then at the end of that eight hours, their life was, is their own, see? But what makes it difficult for the abbot is that the abbot has the men 24 hours a day under his guidance. And so he has to look out for their spiritual growth primarily. It's also a task that uh, encourages one to better oneself. So we're always in Benedict, is, is uh, St. Benedict in his rule, is uh, always encouraging the abbot to, uh, to uh, sometimes see the plank in his eye rather than the little moat that's in the other, in the brother's eyes. And, and always rule with mercy rather than justice, but let mercy reign. But whether he be typist, librarian, cook, builder, or housekeeper, each contributes his labor for the good of the family and the glory of God. Here you can be a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter, but, but be doing it for God. You know, you, you're, uh, you're kind of in, involved in, in creation, but yet for, for a, a holy purpose. The Prince of Peace Abbey reflects a traditional monastery in its physical layout. The monks live in a cloistered area, away from the more public areas. They occupy small, individual quarters called cells. There's a library, a refectory or dining room, a kitchen, gardens, and orchards, a guest house for visitors on retreat, a cemetery, and even a pen for animals. The bells are another important feature of an abbey. Bells were considered to kind of have a life of their own, and there's a, a little ceremony. Uh, it's like a baptism. The bell is given a name. The bell is blessed. And especially in monastic life, where there's such an emphasis on obedience to the will of God, and it's this, this call that, to hear the bell and to obey immediately. It's, it's the bells, in effect, mediate God's will for the monk. Once an ancient loudspeaker, they communicate the same message today that they always have. The bells are, are coded information. They, they tell the monk what kind of a day it is. In a monastery, you have a, a, a feast day that has its own special kind of time. A solemnity has a special kind of time. You have the Lenten, the penitential seasons, Lent, Advent. And, and they, you know, time has a different character, its shape and color. And so the bells are something that, that, that tell you what kind of time it is. It, it's kind of, an, you know, a, a, the whole concept approach to time is quite different in a monastery. But the most important structure the one around which monastic life centers is the church. Although it may not resemble a medieval Gothic cathedral, the church at the Prince of Peace Abbey communicates the same message architecturally. When we talk about symbolism, you know, there are many types of symbols. You have uh, uh, many things on the outside that are symbolic of actually what's transpiring on the inside. So uh, the, the triangulization that we see in the church is uh, indicative of the Trinity. Like the ancient cathedrals, this church's art and architecture, both inside and out, depict a wealth of spiritual symbolism. The term icon really means uh, image, and it's uh, the Greek for much more than just a picture because it has a great deal of symbolism. It tells a story about a person. If it's an authentic icon, Jesus always identifies himself in the hand. You can see a yota, sigma, and, and an X, C, or a key, sigma. So he, he designs in his hand also who he is. The eyes follow you, if you'll notice, no matter where you are inside the building. Jesus is holding the book of peace. Basically, that's the scriptures, his scripture. 
And uh, you see the word pax there, pax meaning peace. And that makes him the Princeps Pachas, which is the, the name that's written on the base of that, the granite block just below the icon. Princeps Pachas is the Latin for Prince of Peace. It's all uh, uh, conceived with uh, the Trinity in mind, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The windows first used in ancient churches were not really there, the stained glass windows, to provide illumination because the colors darkened the natural light. They took natural illumination and made of it something symbolic, something like a pictorial gospel with deliberate choice of scenes from the gospels and the scriptures. The artist who designed this church wanted the windows to use uh, no pictorial representations. These would not represent figures such as persons or flowers or stars. The windows are a Christological reality, a Christological symbol, because they give light, first of all, and so they are a symbol of Christ. They are a sign of life, specifically because Father Gabriel, who designed the church, chose for the windows a palette of only the warm colors, the amber spectrum, red, orange, yellow. The other part of this design is the movement, which also suggests life. The windows have an intense movement to them in some places, which give uh, an impression of life. The Prince of Peace Abbey is one of 41 Benedictine monasteries in the United States. It began in the late 50s when monks from St. Meinrad's Abbey in Indiana relocated to Southern California. Like most monasteries in the New World, St. Meinrad stems from European origins. In this case, the Abbey of Maria Einsiedel in Switzerland founded in 934 A.D. The Prince of Peace Abbey sits serenely on top of a hill near the Pacific Ocean. When we came here there was just tomatoes and zucchini growing and uh, we had great hopes but we never had the, uh, the kind of uh, sense of of success that is that God's blessed us with so far. Ironically, it also overlooks Camp Pendleton, one of the country's largest marine training bases. We chose Prince of Peace uh, because uh, we're, we're in close proximity to, to the machines of war, you might say, is uh, Camp Pendleton, and then also we want to be known as a haven for peace. Just as monks have always shared their spiritual and material blessings with those around them. The monks at the Prince of Peace Abbey give to their surrounding community in many ways. We've taken care of many poor people. We have done uh, help in parishes. We've given retreats and we've counseled many people. We have uh, uh, helped uh, the indigent. We've been called on in many respects by uh, people who are uh, in a spiritual need. Once every week, I, I go on Camp Pendleton and help, help out with their, with their religious ed program on Camp Pendleton. And I work with the teenagers, the dependents of the soldiers. And so that's just one little thing that, you know, being here has been kind of an enrichment for me. The Abbey's most well-known contributor, Brother Benno, was twice named Oceanside Citizen of the Year. He began a food distribution service to the poor, which continues today, many years after his death. 
We have three vans that do nothing but collect food from various markets, uh, Vaughn's, uh, uh, Safeway, and uh, Lucky's, and Ralph's, and so on. So we pick that up and bring it up to the monastery. The stuff that needs refrigeration, we keep. We have a walk-in freezer and a walk-in cooler. And then a lot of the stuff is perishable, so it has to get out uh, quite quickly. So uh, we distribute it to, to places that really are in need. And then uh, quite a few people come up here also. We give them food. The Prince of Peace Abbey also serves as a retreat for outsiders to visit and share the spiritual environment. We uh, consider ourselves primarily to be doing that, offering a place for others uh, to experience God, to come and pray. Um, and so whatever we can do, all the work that Brother Clement does in landscaping and so forth is part of our uh, treatment of people that they might find God here. And we can help them find God, both in, centered, of course, in the church, but not only in the church, and everything gyrates around that uh, and has a kind of a centripetal uh, attraction to the uh, altar in the church. It ought to be a place for, for people. It's, it's, it's for people to, to, to get closer to God, I, I hope. How does someone break free from the hectic demands of modern life and seek the solitude a monastery offers? It's a great ministry. Everybody has a vocation. We call it a calling. And uh, uh, no one can really say, I'm, I'm a doctor, or I'm a minister, or I, I'm married because of this or that. There's m many uh, uh, mysteries behind the, the final decision. But because God has his own plan for each one of us, and it's up to us to, to listen and to respond because each one of us are made for something very special. Oh God, come to my assistance. Some people come to a, a vocation because they are attracted by the community. Some uh, by a very uh, uh, outstanding and, and uh, impressive abbot himself. Some by the rules, studying a history or whatever. The vocation from God, I had a few things in my favor. I had a brother who was 10 years ahead of me in the monastery at the mother house at St. Minot in southern Indiana. And I had a sister five miles from there in the mother house at the Benedictine convent of sisters over there. And uh, that helped quite a bit. What brought me? It certainly wasn't my doing, that's for sure. Way back when I was young, you know, uh, in the Philippines, they used to ask you when you were young, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remembered, you know, when I was seven, I want to be a missionary in Africa, and I want to be a doctor, and uh, to help them. And then I grew up, and then my father told me, oh, no, you won't be a doctor. You had to take accounting, you know, like me. You had to follow my footsteps. I just followed my brother's... Uh, older brothers, they are in the Franciscan orders. My father has uh, six brothers, priests, and we come from a religious family as such. Uh, we are Brahmins, and it's a priestly family, priestly tribe back in India. And so it was easy for us to join the order. It's not so much that I chose it, it's really a kind of a, God chose me. I worked for six years as an accountant in L.A. County, and then uh, everything is so empty still. Most people think that uh, because you join the monastery, you've been jilted in love, or you have nowhere else to go, or uh, life is a dead end, or, or what have you. But I think, for me, fortunately, it's been just the opposite. I had a very full and very rich life before I joined the monastery. I was in the service, I was in Vietnam, I was in the Peace Corps, I worked with handicapped people, I did a number of uh, woodworking projects, and uh, God just kept drawing me closer and closer to Him, to serve Him in a more focused fashion. We're not really running away from anything, and, uh, but we, we are running closer to uh, something. As it was in the beginning. 
And I have a feeling that uh, maybe, you know, I have a call from God that I should do something beside, you know, uh, just work and doing, you know, normal things. I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, and in the beginning of my recovery, which was in 1984, I was on a search for God. And as I, um, I think, came to a closer relationship with God, I became more hungry. And so I desired more. So much so that I converted to the Catholic faith. And then with less than two years after that, I um, was blessed to be able to enter the monastery. My life was kind of a wandering, a philosophical college student, not any place definite to go. And uh, God started showing me in no uncertain terms that wandering is not the way to go, but he wanted me on his side. I used to go into chapel during the eighth grade when we had a special retreat. And I used to, you know, go to the chapel and kneel down and pray, Dear God, why do you want me to do this? You know, why can't I be normal? and and just get married and have a family like everybody else, you know. Why are you, are you asking me, you know, to, to dedicate my life to you in this way? And so, and, uh, and so I, he, he won out. <laughs> what does a person get or experience from living the monastic life? Well, it can't be seen. I, th I think it's the best place in the world, but it's something you can't tell somebody about. You really have to live the life for four to five years before you can even begin to see it. It's easy to romanticize, um, and, and again, it is a, a beautiful life, but at the same time, I believe it was Mother Teresa who once said, um, or actually somebody asked her, he said, are you married, Mother? And she says, Oh yes, I'm married to Jesus, and sometimes he can be very demanding. I'm, I'm happy here, and I think, uh, and I believe, and I think this is what God wants me to be. I think the spiritual life here is very fulfilling, you know. I find it very satisfying, and uh, so that's why I joined them. For me, it's a climate. <laughs> it's a way of, of living the gospel authentically and, and that's something that's very attractive almost immediately it, because it's, it's a way of perfecting the human person. But just how easy can it be to perfect the human person in a monastery? When you have 24, 25 men living so close to one another that uh, uh, it can be very difficult. We find out very quickly that we're built upside down. Our nose runs and our feet smell, you see. And so we, we become very human because we are right there on top of one another, see. And so any, any friction that goes on, uh, it, it comes to a head very quickly. Without the quest for God, we kill each other. That's the only thing that keeps the peace. In spite of the difficulty of following a rigorous spiritual regimen, the monk's fine monastery life has its rewards. It is a constant service to the, to the Lord in daily life and uh, our consecration of our lives uh, to Christ through uh, others with whom we live. That makes it special. Our life has two things. We have physical life and we have the spiritual life. And those things have to go together in harmony to achieve happiness. I find our way of life here at Prince of Peace has preserved some of the character of more of the European monasteries. One of the nice things about Prince of Peace Abbey is that um, there is a small enough community to get to know each and every person. The monks live and pray and, uh, and be involved with, um, with God's presence. But other people in the area have supported us with their help, 
with their prayers and with their finances. And th this is a wonderful statement that is made by the local community. And, uh, and it's very evident in, you know, in a small community as this of how much they want us here and how much they want God in their life. Scholars and historians agree that monasticism laid the foundation for modern civilization. Its simple, practical way of life preserved sanity and stability as Rome disintegrated. Its devotion to education and culture carried civilization forward despite hundreds of years of the destructive barbarian sieges. Its faith in the teachings of Christ built a religious legacy that has lasted for almost two millennia. But Christianity has matured and life is very different now. Modern man has advantages his counterparts a thousand years ago wouldn't have imagined. People have access today to so much that uh, wasn't accessible to the general public centuries before. Even on the internet one can find information regarding the most obscure of Christian teachings. You need, need not go to a monastic library as you would have had to do in the Middle Ages. So where does that leave today's monasteries? Christian monasticism is an extremist form of life and we are really on the fringe of the society in a way we never were before. So we have in an odd way a new kind of seclusion that the ancient monks never would have imagined. And the seclusion isn't so much physical as it is ideological. The challenge in Western society and Western culture is, is going to be just that it seems people are, their own identity seems to be collapsing down in, into themselves as consuming creatures, as, as, uh, as eco economic entities, rather than you know, living in the full, fullness of the, of the potential of, of the human person. And, and, I, and I think that's why Western society is the most difficult place for monasticism right now. We have life which our culture would measure as quite wasteful. We, we waste hours a day on nothing short of divine worship. And some would scoff at this as a waste of time, as I've already said. This wastefulness asserts to an unbelieving culture or a materialistic world, technological world, that the human being is not a means to production and profit. Uh, that, at its worst, is simply slavery. So how does monasticism fit into this technological world, which seems to care little about spiritual expression? Monasticism isn't contrived uh, to achieve what it has secondarily happened to achieve. It is not of this world nor for this world, but being uh, for values that uh, uh, give a permanence to the permanent things in this world, it, it, does ma it, it has made its contribution. We will continue to play a role similar to what monasteries played in the Middle Ages. We will be mission stations for authentic human spirituality uh, and authentic Christian spirituality. People will see us doing things a certain way, you know, having a certain scale of, of values and priorities that I think they can learn from. Just things like, you know, we're not, 
you know, chasing a buck isn't the most important thing that we're doing, but we give time for prayer in the important times of, of the day, the real, you know, the really key times of the day, the quality time, so to speak, for us is, is when we're in church. In the morning Since the monastic life has continued for almost 2,000 years, it seems to me that it's not going to collapse under conditions that are similar to what they've gone through already. What role, then, can monasticism play in our future? I think there's going to be a strong future for monasticism, especially when you look at something like what happened in, in Russia, where under the, uh, you know, the communist government, everything was suppressed. But as soon as that, you know, that heavy curtain was lifted and there was some freedom for the human spirit to, to realize itself, to realize its spiritual nature. Well, if you look at Russia now, the monasteries are starting to fill up again. Monasticism will definitely survive. It has for over 1,500 years. I think that's a testament in itself. And I think, uh, again, monastic life will be the uh, uh, example for people in the future because we are so Right now, so many people are stressed and, and overworked, and, and so they, they come to the monastery now and find that peace. And that's why more and more people are, are coming to monasteries, because they sense that peace that's there. They realize there's something here that they do not find out in the world. Christian monasticism has been here for centuries, and it intends to stay. We will continue to offer to the children of the West, its own Christian heritage, uh, will, as it were, keep it away in this new age that is perhaps darker than the ages called the Dark Ages. The sons of men find refuge in the shelter of your wings. Our apostolate is the liturgy. humble way with the means that we have and the few people that we have and uh, uh, the whatever talent we have. Uh, we provide a way that people can come and join in our prayer and uh, benefit from the uh, kind of uh, uh, space and environment, prayerful environment that we make. That's our primary concern. Everything else is secondary. I would like to see us uh, become a more um, uh, of a haven for peace and then also attract uh, men who want to uh, really fulfill their own vocations. So then we can be a witness to the world. We're in, in this for, for good and uh, we're very happy about it. And we, we think that uh, the world needs something of this na nature because of uh, the condition of mankind, are, they're seeking something besides uh, the worldly pursuits and worldly happiness, because we're made for something greater. <laughs>